Αυτό είναι εδώ για να μάθουν πράγματα και όχι για να πούμε. Ε, η ΕΛΑΚ ως ε, μη κερδοσκοπική εταιρεία φτιαγμένη από τα περισσότερα ελληνικά πανεπιστήμια προωθεί την ιδέα των ελεύθερων τεχνολογιών ε, με πολλές δράσεις. Μία από αυτές είναι η ομάδα εργασίας που έχουμε. Άρα, ε, αν δείτε το site θα δείτε τις πρωτοβουλίε και μπορείτε να συμμετάσχετε. Εγώ σαν καλωσόρισμα θυμήθηκα τι ενέπνευσε ε, την έρευνα μου και θα ήθελα να πω μόνο αυτές τις τρεις φράσεις που όταν διάβασα με συντάραξα. Είναι, από, είναι στα αγγλικά και είναι από το manifest of the hacker του Mackenzie Ward και λέει το εξής. It is not just information that must be free, but the knowledge of how to use it. The test of a free society is not the liberty to consume information, nor to produce it, not even to implement its potential in the private world of one's choosing. Και αυτό που είναι σημαντικό είναι ότι the test of a free society is the liberty for the collective transformation of the world through abstraction, freely chosen and freely actualized. Θέλω να πω λοιπόν ότι αρχίζει πια να μας προβληματίζει ουσιαστικά το πώς θα μπορέσουμε να συμμετάσχουμε εμείς και μάλλον περισσότερο τα παιδιά μας σε αυτούς τους συλλογικούς μετασχηματισμούς με τις, λιγότερο, με τις λιγότερες δυνατές ε, αντιστάσεις και σε έναν πολύ δύσκολο και πολύ πλοκό κόσμο. Καλωσορίζω λοιπόν σήμερα έναν α, από τους ανθρώπους που θα μπορούσε να μας δώσει ιδέες και εμπνεύσει για να το κάνουμε αυτό ο καθένας με το δικό του τρόπο. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. photo of me, please do not put it in Facebook or Instagram. That is a spying company. It does surveillance on the people it uses, and it does surveillance on everyone else as much as it can. It uses face recognition to do this. So if you put the, the photo of someone into Facebook, together with any other data, including your identity, you are giving Facebook more information about that person. It is a bad treatment of that person. I urge you never to do that to your friends, but in any case, please don't do that to me. Second, <clears throat> if you want to make a recording, audio, or video of this talk, and distribute copies. Please distribute them solely in the formats that are favorable to free software, which means the AUG formats or WebM format. Please do not distribute them in MP anything, because in some countries those formats are patented, and their use harms the free software community. Don't use Flash, especially don't use Flash to distribute anything. Uh, and don't use Windows Media Player, Real Player, or QuickTime. QuickTime is particularly bad because it's associated with iTunes, which is an extremely nasty system because it requires people to use non-free software to access anything, and they can only do it on the platforms of a the company that is the worst enemy of uh, the freedom of users of computing. And please uh, make sure that the distribution site, in its normal mode of use, permits people to download copies without running any non-free software themselves. That's not the case for YouTube. While YouTube distributes the WebM format, which is a good format to use, you can't do anything, you can't see it, without running non-free JavaScript code from the site. So YouTube is not an acceptable distribution site. And 
Please put on the recordings the Creative Commons No Derivatives License because this is a presentation of my point of view. Now, how many of you, raise your hands if you were at my talk on Saturday. A few. Raise your hand if you believe you could state the four freedoms that define free software. Very few. Although the, talk of, the topic of this talk is not free software, I will give a brief <coughs> summary of free software. Free software means that the users of the program have control over the program. With non-free software, it's the opposite. The program controls the users, and the owner controls the program. So the non-free program is developed in order to give the owner power over those users. It's inherently unjust. For your freedom's sake, you should never tolerate a non-free program in your life. But even worse, non-free software is typically malware. If you use non-free software, it's almost certain that you are using known proprietary malware. What does the malware do? It spies on people, or it's designed to restrict people in what they do with the data in their computers. This is called DRM, Digital Restrictions Management or it has a back door which accepts commands from the owner and maybe from others to do nasty things to the user or it imposes censorship on the user or maybe it does two, three, or four of those things like Microsoft Windows which does all four <laughs> like the software of the iThings, which does all four. Just about every mobile phone has a back door, a universal back door, for remotely imposing any software change. And this has been used to convert them into listening devices that listen all the time and transmit whatever they hear, and if you think you can get your privacy back by shutting it off, ha ha, it pretends to shut off, but really it keeps running and listening and transmitting, and the only way to stop it is to remove all the batteries, not just the obvious one. In other words, proprietary software is so full of malware I'd give you more examples if this were a talk about free software. We have a long list of examples. See gnu.org slash proprietary. Proprietary software is for suckers. <laughs> it's so likely to mistreat you that you cannot rationally trust it. To trust proprietary software is to be a sucker. So, recover your freedom, reject proprietary software, and come to the free world. That's why we developed the GNU operating system, which is used with Linux as the kernel, so that it's possible to use computers in freedom, having control over our own computing instead of letting some company control it. So, for more info on free software, look at gnu.org and fsf.org. And if you want to help the cause, look at gnu.org slash help. It gives a list of various ways you can help us. You can join the Free Software Foundation through fsf.org or because I'm here, you have an opportunity to pay your dues in cash. And by the way, paying cash is a good way to avoid being tracked. But do insist on a receipt to make sure that the business pays its taxes. <clears throat> so, this talk is not about free software. It's about a threat that affects all software developers 
and all commercial software users directly. And that is the threat of getting sued because of the ideas implemented in the program. This is about the harm done by allowing the patent system to affect software. Now, the term software patent is somewhat misleading. A lot of people see that and they think it's about patenting software. Well, it's not. Nobody patents software. There is no patent in the world that's about one particular program. A patent like that would be so narrow that nobody would bother to apply for it. And it would be so narrow that it wouldn't hurt anybody. It would make no difference. The reason computing idea patents are so dangerous is that they don't cover one program. In fact, a patent is not related to one particular program, never. Every patent, and this is true in all areas, is a monopoly imposed on using an idea, some specific idea. And in the patent, it says what the idea is. And then anybody who does that can get sued. And sometimes these ideas are very general and very loosely stated so that thousands of different things could all get sued with the same patent. <clears throat> now, you may have heard somebody use the misguided term, quote, intellectual property, unquote. This term spreads confusion and error whenever it is used because it incorporates a supposition which is false. There are various laws that exist. Now, patent law is one of them, and another one is copyright law, which is totally different from patent law, nothing in common. And then there's trademark law, which has nothing in common with those two. And then there's trade secret law, which is totally different and then there is the plant variety monopoly law and the uh, integrated circuit mask law and the uh, geographical product name law. And these laws are totally different. But somebody had the brilliant and horrible idea to talk about them all as if they were one kind of thing. And they gave that the seductive name, quote, intellectual property, unquote. And when people hear statements like, patents are a kind of intellectual property, it leads them to formulate the world the wrong way. Because they imagine that there's a thing that you could call, quote, intellectual property, unquote, about which you can say a lot of valid, concrete things and it has these various types, which are basically similar, but there are little differences. That's false. These laws are almost totally different. The only thing they have in common is their own laws. So if you assume that they're similar, you're already so mistaken that you can't understand anything about what these laws do. The first step in understanding patent law is to realize that everything you've heard about copyright or quote intellectual property unquote is totally irrelevant to patent law. Forget it all, discard it all, and then you'll have a clean slate which won't lead you astray. Now, for the, the reason I campaign against the use of quote intellectual property unquote is because I want people to understand what patents actually do. And that means getting rid of the story that tells them the wrong thing about what patents actually do. I hope you will join me in firmly insisting on never using that term. So what does the patent system do? 
Most descriptions of the patent system are stated from the viewpoint of somebody who works in the patent system, say patent holders or patent lawyers or uh, people in patent departments of companies or, or nowadays it's sad to say universities are just as corrupt. And they are all in favor of patents. They want more patents for their, their own reasons. So they present a slanted description. They, they show you what the patent system looks like from the point of view of those that benefit from it. Namely, those who have patents or hope to have patents. They talk about how nice it is to have a patent in your pocket and every so often to pull it out and point it at somebody and say, give me your money. If you're unscrupulous, that must feel great. So to counteract that, counteract that, I'm going to describe the patent system from the standpoint of the victims, those who do things like develop software and have to be afraid all the time that whoever passes by is going to pull out a patent and say, give me your money. <clears throat> so how did he get a patent? Well. It's not automatic, it requires an application. Uh, there's a pretty expensive application fee, uh, which will be thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, and paying somebody to write the application so it will be approved costs even more than that. It's not easy to do. There's an arcane set of rules for that. Well, the patent may then be approved or not. If it's approved, well, then so this person has, or company typically, has a license to sue anyone that does anything that fits the description listed in that patent. And that's the only thing that really matters in the patent, is the, the description of what people are not allowed to do. <clears throat> And then it lasts, uh, typically, in most countries, for 20 years, uh, which is a long time in the computing field. So, <clears throat> what does this mean for you if you've developed software? Suppose you want to work with the patent system. That means, I suppose, first you want to find out which patents the program you've developed violates. You can't. First of all, uh, that's because patents may be issued tomorrow. Today, maybe there's no patent that your program violates, and tomorrow one might be issued. The applications being considered are kept secret for 18 months. That means somebody might have applied for a patent six months ago, and you won't find out until a year from now, which could make a horrible surprise for you. And this really happens. In the 1980s, there was a program called Compress for compressing files. It was a free program, and people used it. And when it was first published in 1984, there was no patent on the LCW Compress. Uh, something seems to have died. <laughs> Hello? Yep, this is, is this still working at all? No. 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 Hello? No, nope. really, it's not in the, it's not just in the mic, it's in something else. Is there anyone here who can fix this? Please raise your hand if you cannot hear me. <laughs> It looks like almost everyone can hear me. I guess I can just continue, right? So you can't hear me. Uh-oh. Sorry. Could you hear me when the microphone was working? 
You can hear me from over here. What? It's working again? Oh, that's good. So, in 1984, when that program was published, there was no patent on the LZW compression algorithm it used. A patent was issued in 1985. The patent holder, cunningly, did not immediately warn all the users of Compress, all the companies that were distributing Compress, that they were in trouble. No, it waited for the user community to dig its grave deeper, several years, and then started threatening people. At this point, I looked around, where can we get a file compression program? Someone wrote to me and said he had developed another compression algorithm that worked better, and he wanted to donate his program to the GNU project. But I decided first to look around and see if it was patented too. A couple of weeks before we were going to release the program, another patent was issued, and sure enough, it covered that program. That program was never used. It was killed off by a patent before it was born. Eventually, someone came up with another compression algorithm, which is the one used in GZIP, and everybody switched to that. And so the problem was solved in the domain of compressing files. But uh, this shows how the danger of patents that haven't been issued yet is real. And you can't find out about them. But you might think, how about if I make a list of all the ideas in my program? You can't do that either. Because there's more than one way to conceptualize the same code. But you already have one that you worked out in the course of writing that code. And that's the way you're going to see it. But someone else could look at it and conceptualize it differently. There are other ideas that could be seen in your code, even though they're not the way you understand it. And if those ideas are patented, you could get sued for those also. If you imagine that your program is, uh, well, if we make an analogy with graphic design, suppose you've drawn a square and you say, well, okay, the idea in this is a square, so you could verify that there's no patent on a square, but what if there's a patent on a diamond shape? All someone has to do is turn your program 45 degrees, and if he's got a patent on diamond shapes, you're in trouble. So, neither of those is possible. But you can make up a list of all the issued patents, that might affect your program. You can do it, but it's hard because there are many hundreds of thousands of them. Keeping up with all the new ones is a full-time job. <clears throat> so you're not gonna be able to check them all. You're gonna have to narrow it down somehow, for instance, with a, with a textual search for keywords. And you'll find a lot of patents that might be pertinent, which you'll then have to have somebody check. But you'll find, but you won't find them all. For instance, for a long time, spreadsheets were threatened by a patent on natural order recalculation. Now that's a, a feature so basic that you might not think it needs a name, but the first spreadsheet recalculated from top to bottom, always. Which means if this cell depended on this cell, which depended on this cell, you have to say recalculate, recalculate twice to get it to propagate up. And then when they started doing this in computers that were a little bigger, of course they made it propagate until all the propagation was done. So everything was consistent. That's natural or recalculation. Every time a cell depends on things that have changed, recalculate it until you're done. Well, 
Somebody once asked me for a copy of that patent, and I had a copy on paper. So I looked up the number in our file, I pulled that one out, I copied it, I sent it to him, and a week later he said, I think you sent me the wrong patent. This is about compilers. So I looked at our file, pulled it out again, and yes, it said, a, a method for compiling formulas into object code. So I wondered, did the file have the wrong patent number? Was this the wrong one? I started reading the important thing, which is the list of what people are not allowed to do. The only part of the patent that really matters. And yes, it was the natural order recalculation patent, but it didn't use that term. Really, it was a patent on every conceivable variant way to implement topological sort. But it didn't use the term topological sort. If you were searching for that, if you were writing a spreadsheet and wanted to see all the patents that might get you sued, you would not have found that one. You would not have found out about it until someone told you that other spreadsheet developers were getting sued. Your search would, although it wouldn't find all the patents that might target your project, you'll find a lot of them. Then what? Then you have to have somebody study them together with your project and together with a patent lawyer who understands what those terms mean and, how, and the right way to interpret them. And that's going to take a lot of time and cost a lot of money. And at the end, the, the patent lawyer is going to find many patents that might target you. And for each one, he's going to say, if you do something in this area, you'll almost certainly lose. But if you want to have a good chance of winning, you should stay out of this area. And if you want to be really safe, stay out of this area. But there's a substantial element of chance in the outcome of any lawsuit. Now that you have found out the uh, predictable uh, basis for doing business, what can you actually do? There are three options for dealing with each of these patents. Avoid it, get a license for it, or defeat it in court. To avoid it, well, that means stay out of this area, but you still have some element of chance in the outcome. <clears throat> some patents are easy to avoid. They're very narrow and specific. For instance, I saw a patent on a variant of the fast Fourier transform, which ran about twice as fast. For almost all applications, the ordinary fast Fourier transform would be good enough. So you could avoid that patent easily. And then there are some applications for which would run barely fast enough with the faster algorithm, and they would be too slow with the ordinary FFT, and there you'd be screwed. But those will not be very many. That would be an unusual situation. So that patent is rather narrow in its, in its targeting. But then, what about the patent on the LZW compression algorithm? I told you how it took a substantial amount of work to avoid that patent and compress files. But still, we did. We ended up with a program that was faster and did better compression, was better in every way. But, um, what about compressing images? That same algorithm is used in GIF files. But there, people couldn't just switch to a different format because it was safe. 
The problem is there were lots of GIF files floating around the internet and lots of programs that could make them and lots of programs that could use them. And there was basically so much of society's effort was invested in GIF format that we never were able to get people to stop. We even had Burn All GIFs Day asking people to switch to ping format. Uh, informally, ping stands for pings, not GIF. And the reason for it was GIF format was dangerous. In fact, the patent holder was suing somebody, was suing websites because they were publishing GIF files. And the patent holder was saying, unless you can be sure that each of these GIFs was made with a properly licensed program, then you are infringing just by distributing those GIF files that other people uploaded to your site. This may seem like a kind of extortion, but extortion is what patents are about. <clears throat> and then there are tremendously broad patents well, that cover an entire field. For instance, the patent that covers all public key encryption wiped out that field with the sole exception of Lotus Notes. Nothing else could implement public key encryption until that patent expired. <clears throat> and sometimes, uh, right, um, I'm trying to remember the good example. Um, there are many obvious features that are patented. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy of the graphic, but if you look at ffii.org, you can find their graphic, your web shop is patented, where it shows uh, the screen of an ordinary web shop from 10 years ago uh, and uh, pointing out features that were covered by patents issued by the European Patent Office. <clears throat> so avoiding a patent may be easy or it may just kill your project or something in between. What about getting a license for the patent? The problem is that may be rather expensive. The patent holder doesn't have to offer you any kind of license. The patent holder can, and so it may be expensive or impossible. Some patent holders say, you can't have a license. I want you to shut down your business. For instance, I got asked for help by somebody whose business was making computerized casino games. He had been threatened by a competitor that had a patent which covered <clears throat> a network with multiple computers, each of which could show several game se sessions at once, and maybe it also included that they were multiplayer games. I can't remember that point anymore after 25 years or so. The point is, well, the first point is, I'm, that's something so trivial that nobody would have bothered to publish it. Uh, I'm sure there was a university in the 1980s, back before that patent was uh, issued or even applied for, that set up a network of workstations and put on them a few multiplayer games and they had some kind of window system so you could display multiple windows of multiple games. And that was exactly what the patent said was forbidden, but nobody would have published an article saying, look what I did, it was too trivial, it would have aroused no admiration from anyone. Uh, but anyway, even the, and even this, 
Well, the patent was ridiculous. We couldn't prove it was invalid. And he wasn't offered a license. He had to shut his business. Most patent holders will offer a license, but it will cost a lot. Unless you are a giant multinational company. Because the giant companies in any field typically own around half the patents. And they cross-license each other. Which means, for them, it's easy to get a license to somebody else's patents. But not for us. Those of us that are not giant multinational companies, we are down below. They're sitting on top of this castle on this peak, looking down at us, and we can't possibly get up where they are. They have thousands of patents, typically. No matter how smart you are, even if you're in Edison, you can't get up there. <clears throat> so they cross license each other, but we, and, and the reason is each one has a lot of patents and says to the others, cross-license with me or I'll attack you. And the other one says, oh, cross-license with me or I'll attack you. And then they say, okay, let's cross-license. But if a small company can't do that, you'll see lots of small companies saying to their employees, we need patents to defend ourselves. <coughs> That's bullshit. They can't, a small company can't defend itself that way. <clears throat> Suppose the small company gets three patents, and one points over there, one points over there, and one points over there. And then somebody over there points a patent at the company. Well, these patents don't point there, so the company can't defend itself from that aggressor. In fact, most aggressors this company can't protect itself from. It, as a small company, it can't get enough patents to have coverage everywhere the way IBM does. <clears throat> On the other hand, sooner or later, somebody, some executive is going to realize, hey, we've got a patent over there, pointing over there, and there are people over there. We could squeeze money out of them. Why not? This is what business is about in the 21st century, attacking anybody who goes in front of your sights. So it's vital if the company says that to you, to say, I want you to promise in writing that this patent can only be used for defense, either self-defense or mutual defense. I want this to be something that can't be revoked, and then I'll help you get patents because I won't have to hate myself for it. This is the only basis on which patents in the software field can ethically be obtained. It is committing to use them only for defense. Now, <clears throat> there are certain software developers for whom getting licenses is particularly hard, namely free software developers. And the reason is a free program permits redistribution. <clears throat> Everybody is free to make copies and then give or sell them to others. The result is we don't know how many copies there are and we can't make people tell us how many copies there are. If we made them tell us, it would not be free software anymore. So even if the patent holder offered me a license for one millionth of a euro per copy, I couldn't carry out, I couldn't compute how much I owe. It's probably in my pocket, but I don't know that. Right? Maybe it's 10 euro, maybe it's 100 euro, how would I ever know? But in fact, uh, license, patent licenses tend to cost, say, a hundred thousand dollars to start with, plus a substantial amount 
uh, for each copy. Free software is completely excluded by that. <clears throat> the third way to deal with a patent is to invalidate it. This, re this may or may not be possible depending on the facts of what occurred in the past. To invalidate the patent, where you can either use some sort of uh, something about the way it's written, which, you know, if they made a mistake, then you could, and you could prove it's a mistake, that might invalidate the patent. Or it could be invalidated based on something substantive, namely, if you can prove the idea was known to the public before the application was filed, that invalidates the patent. That's called prior art. The thing is, you have to find proof of what was known to the public in the past. Now, for something that's a great discovery, of course, people talk about it. But for something that's trivial, they're not going to bother. Nobody that set up a workstation for the students in a school was going to bother mentioning in print that the workstation supported windowing systems and had several multiplayer games loaded on them. It would have been unimportant even if someone published an article about setting up that network for the students, they wouldn't bother mentioning the games. So the result is we can't find any proof of the prior art we suspect exists for that patent. And this is quite common. Something is, it's worth the trouble of patenting it, but it's not worth the trouble of publishing an article about it. Part of this is because the patent system has its standards for what counts as unobvious. And those standards are very low. So low that to programmers they appear ridiculous. For instance, According to the Patent Office rules, if we already have devices that do A and devices that do B, if you can show how to build a device that can do either A or B, that's an invention. We call it an if-then-else statement. But for the patent system, that's an invention. That's a non-trivial idea. And if there's a, a device that can do something once, and someone comes up with the idea of a device that can do it multiple times, any number of times, for us, that's a for loop. But for the patent office, that's an invention. Just the idea that you could do this thing more than once, any number of times, they say is an invention. There are patents just like that. So, of course, we are flooded by these trivial ideas that are patented. Which is not to say that all patents in the software field that are harmful are trivial. The LZW compression algorithm was not trivial, but the patent did tremendous harm. I should point out that, in fact, if you wanted to license the patent, it was not clear who you would get a license from. In fact, there were two different patents, both about the LZW data compression algorithm. And since they weren't written exactly the same, you had to study them to realize that they both covered the LZW algorithm. So were they both valid, or was only one of them valid? It's not clear. There was never a, a court case to decide that. They, they weren't written exactly the same way. They didn't, they didn't say that they were patenting the same idea because each one included a partial description of LZW. And they were different partial descriptions. Are that is only one of those patents valid, or are they both valid? 
And then the program that was going to replace it, that was never released because a patent came out just before we were going to release it. By the way, it's a good thing that it came out then. If it had come out a year later, it would have been even worse. Uh, well, that algorithm got patented twice, too. And when an algorithm is more complicated, uh, for instance, uh, MPEG-2 video, well, it's common for that one activity to be covered by dozens of patents. And it's hard to tell whether any of them invalidate or supersede any others, because they, they overlap partly. <clears throat> so, the JPEG Standards Committee was going to develop a follow-on standard, a JPEG version 2 standard, and they gave up. They said, with all the patents in that area, it was not feasible to develop a spec that people would be able to use. <clears throat> now, occasionally you can invalidate a patent. I've had at least one patentable idea in my life. And I know it because somebody else patented it later. It's a feature in Emacs where you can define an abbreviation. So you could define CMT as an abbreviation for committee. And then whenever you type CMT space or comma or period or any punctuation, it magically turns into committee followed by the same punctuation. Somebody patented this around 1985 or so, but Emacs had this feature in the 1970s, and fortunately there was the Emacs manual in a copy that was old enough to prove this, and eventually the patent was invalidated. But it took many years, and the patent holder was threatening word processor developers, and some of them actually had to remove the feature. <clears throat> so, uh, basically, what you'll find is each of these three ways of dealing with a patent may or may not be possible for you in your project. Sometimes you can avoid the patent. Sometimes you can afford to get a license for it. Although, watch out, maybe you can afford one license, but how many do you have to get? The the natural order recalculation patent was being offered, licenses were being offered for 5% of the sales price of the spreadsheet. Well, I guess one of them might have been possible, but what if you had to get 20 such licenses and pay 100% of the sales price in license fees? And then what about when you patent holder number 21 comes by and wants 5% more. Now you have to pay 105% of your sales price. But actually, this is absurd. People in business told me that once you had to pay 15%, your business would fail. You'd never get near 20 such licenses. So basically, sometimes you can avoid it, sometimes it's feasible to license it, and sometimes you could invalidate it, and sometimes you can't do any of those things, and your project is dead. But patent lawyers, at least in the US and some other countries, say you shouldn't try to work with the patent system at all. Because if you know what patents exist, 
then you're vulnerable to triple damages. Therefore, patent lawyers say, don't look at the patents. Make sure no one ever tells you about them. Just blindfold yourself and make your design decisions and hope that you don't step on a patent which blows up and kills your project. In practice, you develop your product, you release it, and then you wait and see how much you get hit. And one by one, patent holders threaten you, and you never know how many more there are going to be. It's simply a disaster. Now, <clears throat> when I describe this problem to people with a vested interest in defending the patent system, they often respond with an argument that's totally silly but sounds valid for the first few seconds. They say, well, other fields have learned to live with patents. Why should software be an exception? Now, this is a silly argument. It's like saying, other people have learned to cope with cancer, why shouldn't you? <laughs> if it's harmful, it's always good for any field to be safe from it. But there is, if we remove the spin, there is an intelligent question sort of buried in there somewhere, which is, are there differences between fields which affect how patents affect those various fields differently? And let me tell you one. Fields vary in terms of how a product relates to patents and how patents relate to products. <clears throat> There's a spectrum of how many patents apply to one particular product. And of course, each field occupies a range in that spectrum, but the fields are laid out on the spectrum. At, at that end, there is a simple mythical idea that each product corresponds to one patent. Maybe it was like that in the 1800s, but not since then. However, the pharmaceutical field was like that until a few decades ago, because typically the patents would cover the entire chemical structure of one drug. And patents like that are in one-to-one -one correspondence with drugs. So as long as things work that way, if you invented a new drug, it wasn't patented already by anyone else, and you could get the one and only patent, one and only patent on that drug. But even pharmaceuticals has moved away from that. Now you can develop a new drug and find it's already covered by some broader patents. But only a few. You'll never find that there are a hundred different patents covering one drug because that field is still pretty close to the extreme of simplicity. And you know, this is the mythical picture most people have of the patent system. They assume one product, one patent. But other fields of engineering are farther along the spectrum. And furthest along is software. We in the software field can combine more ideas in one thing than other kinds of engineers because software is inherently easier than the other fields that they work in. They are working with physical matter, which means they have to cope with the perversity of matter. They have models of what matter will do. We have definitions of what software constructs do. It's much easier. The definition can't be wrong. A model can be wrong. It's just a rough approximation. So there are so many problems that they have to cope with that never bother us. For instance, if you want to put 
an if statement inside of a while loop, you don't have to worry that this will repeat at just the wrong frequency so as to cause the if statement to vibrate at a resonant frequency so that it cracks. You don't have to worry that it will rub against the while statement each time and wear it away until it doesn't work. You don't have to worry that corrosive fluids from the environment will get in between the if statement and the while statement and wear and destroy the connection until the data doesn't pass anymore. You don't have to worry about how much heat the if statement will dissipate and how that's going to escape through the while statement. If you store a value in a variable, you don't have to worry how many different places are allowed to read the value of that variable so that they don't exceed the fan out limit. Or how long it's going to take for the value to get into that variable and how that's affected by the capacitance of the things that read it. <clears throat> and you don't have to worry about how supposing the if statement does crack or burn up or corrode, how you're going to remove it and put in a replacement if statement. In fact, you don't have to worry about designing the factory to assemble the if statement into the while statement to make each copy. Physical products have to be designed for manufacturability. Designing the factory can be more work than design, can be the biggest part of designing the product. These things make physical engineering hard. So it takes a lot of work to succeed in combining a few design decisions to make something that you could build and that will work when it's in the field. But Software is like building a castle that stands up on a mathematically zero thickness line because nothing weighs anything. Uh, we can do that. We can just put things together because we know their definitions so it has to work. And that makes our field so easy that we can combine more ideas in, in very, in, you know, in a short time than the people who have to cope with the perversity of matter. So, a program with a million design elements in it might be 300,000 lines of code. A few people can write that in a few years. A physical structure with the same complexity would be a mega project. It would, be, it would cost tens of millions of dollars to design that, uh, and far more to build it. Uh, but the burden of the patent system is the same for the same number of design elements, that the same number of ideas are in there, and the same number of possible things that could be attacked by patents. So, what this shows is the patent system is a much bigger burden in the software field. And the remedy is exclude software from patents entirely. Now, in a country which has never had computational idea patents, they can prevent the problem by legislation that clearly and explicitly says that computational idea patents may not be issued. They must not, they must be careful because they keep copying an erroneous way to do it. The erroneous way that was used in the treaty that set up the European Patent Office, which said that software as such is not patentable. So the European Patent Office says, this patent is not about software as such, it's about a computational idea. And indeed, in that patent, it doesn't say, here's the one program which is covered by this patent. Instead, it describes a computational idea. 
which was what makes the patent broad and really dangerous to a lot of software developers. So you have to be clearer than that. You have to take a, a clear, to, to prevent the issuance of computational idea patents, you have to say, no patent may be issued that covers a series or collection of computational steps, say. But if your country already has that kind of patent, and you pass a law like that, it'll take 20 years for the existing ones to expire. So what you really need to do is change the, is change the definition of patent infringement. You have to define that so that a program written for generally used computing hardware by definition does not infringe that the development, distribution, and use of that program, by definition, do not constitute infringement. That would make the field of software safe. <clears throat> In Europe, there was a long fight against computational idea patents, and we won several times. But the companies that wanted these patents are so powerful, and they have the support, of course, of the European Patent Office, which wants to make itself more important to society by causing more trouble to more activities in society. That's their definition of importance. The more different activities they can arrange to interfere with, the more important they are. And the, then they can pretend that they're doing good because they measure the imaginary good that they claim to be doing by how many areas of life are subject to them. <clears throat> so, the battle was mostly lost through the unitary patent. Through the fine print. You see, the fine print say that the European Patent Office is autonomous. That it makes its own decisions about appeals. So if the European Patent Office decides to legitimize computational idea patents, there's no institution in Europe that can restrain it. And of course, it's already on the side of computational idea patents. It's been issuing them despite a treaty and many votes against it for uh, some decades now. So it was predictable. Anyone who paid attention knew that this directive was equivalent to uh, letting the European Patent Office legitimize computational idea patents. What you can do now, I'm not sure. If there's a way for one country in Europe to get out of the unitary patent, I strongly urge doing that. There are, there are some countries that chose not to participate. A few. I think Spain was one. Well, the government may have done it for minor reasons, but this but the effect is to avoid a horrible disaster, maybe. At least have the chance to avoid it. <clears throat> FFII.org was the main organization in resisting computational idea patents in Europe, and it probably has a lot more information you can get. Now there are some other fields where patents cause special harm. One of them is medicine. And here the issue is a simple matter of price. Not, none of the subtle complications of the grid -like, gridlock caused by patents in the software field. No, it's simply a matter that patents make medicine a lot more expensive. And this simple problem is important because it's a matter of life and death. 
Imposing patents on medicines in poor countries is mass murder. And this is done by the World Trade Organization. The people who set up the World Trade Organization and those who have run it should be put on trial for crimes against humanity. They should spend the rest of their lives in prison. Of course, the World Trade Organization is harmful to democracy. Uh, it must be destroyed for many reasons, and this is just one of them. We can't tolerate a system that s subjugates democracy to the preferences of uh, giant companies. Essentially, that means that the states that participate in those treaties have betrayed their citizens and become governments of occupation. <clears throat> However, this one issue of patents on medicine or medical treatments is the single sharpest evil of the World Trade Organization. Now, the treaty does say that these poor countries can issue mandatory licenses to make medicines in certain kinds of cases. So, big countries such as the US threatened economic pressure against them to get them not to do it. In the 1990s, Vice President Gore was directly involved in pressuring South Africa not to make compulsory licenses for AIDS medicines. And then an activist, an activist against these sorts of injustices said to him, you might be planning to run for president, it's not going to look good if you were doing this. Maybe you should stop. So he stopped, but someone else started doing this for the Clinton administration instead. So, <clears throat> so yes, nominally there is a, a limited escape valve, but it's not easy for countries to use it. And lots of people can be killed when they don't use it or when it its conditions don't apply, and so on. So, uh, that is, I guess, the worst problem caused by patents in terms of the, the sharpness of the evil. Then, there's another field, namely agriculture. When genes are patented, and that are present in the organisms that farmers cultivate, then they are forbidden to breed their own plants and animals, and this denies the traditional freedoms of farmers, which is essentially unjust. Note that these three problems are different in structure. It's not the same problem showing up in three fields. It's three different problems in three fields, coming out of the same law and the same system for handling patents. And then there are a whole bunch of other fields where patents seem to do more harm than good, but no, nothing horribly disastrous. For instance, I suppose that patents on automobile transmissions are not causing a disaster for the world. But there's no sign that they're doing any real good. The claim that they uh, encourage investment doesn't seem to be true anymore. Uh, the claim that progress will be accelerated by patents, well, it wasn't true in the software field. <clears throat> In the software field, research showed that when software patents became <clears throat> generally legally accepted in the US, the result was not more spending on research, it was more spending on patenting. <clears throat> it's 
also theoretically demonstrated that in a field where incremental innovation is common, the existence of a patent system can reduce the investment in research and development. You see, the supporters of this is important because the support of pat the supporters of patents in any particular field, such as the software field, want us to take for granted that no matter what the harm it may do, it must surely promote the advance of technology. That we're supposed to take that for granted. We're also supposed to, now, but that's, and they claim that's because it will increase the investment in research. And that is supposed to imply that technology will advance faster, but it doesn't. There's a flaw in that step. You see, research is only part of the activity of making new programs. Yes, you need to have ideas to combine. But just having ideas to combine doesn't mean you can make a good program. Because the hardest part of making a good program is picking the ideas to combine and doing a good job of implementing them. You can't just pick up these ideas and drop them into something and say, here. No, you have to implement them all together. And you have to do a good job of that. And that's a much bigger job than getting the ideas. In fact, you'll have ideas just because you're developing a program. And you'll use your ideas because they seem good to you unless you decide they're not. So the development of program spins off ideas. We get ideas without making a sacrifice to get them just because there are people developing programs. And if the others are free to use the ideas that work well, well, we get the advance. So when we start making a pain, so the point is, here we have an artificial system to provide an incentive for a, a secondary part of the job by choking the hardest and biggest part of the job. It's self-defeating. It can mean fewer ideas generated because fewer people dare to develop programs that get used. And that means less ideas coming from each program that you can see, because if you use it. So even if it increases the investment in research, we could still have fewer ideas that result as, as well as making life difficult and dangerous for software developers. But due to research, which was from, uh, I think it's Eric von Hippel at the Sloan School, we see it might reduce the spending on research too. So you could lose at every level. <clears throat> now, when we explain these things to non-programmers, they may not realize how harmful it is to have the ideas you need to implement and combine be subject to monopolies. If you've never written programs, you may not realize what this means. So it's good to show an analogy in a field people understand better. Music. <clears throat> Let's imagine that the governments of Europe in the 1700s had decided to set up a system of musical idea patents because they wanted to promote the progress of music and believe that musical idea patents would encourage composers to invent more musical ideas. So, under this system, it would have been possible to patent any musical idea that could be described in words. And they would have patented, say, uh, melodic, motif, uh, melodic motifs, or rhythm patterns, or uh, structures of a movement or the use of certain instruments together, perhaps uh, only temporarily while the other instruments in the orchestra were silent, uh, all sorts of 
different kinds of musical ideas would have been patented. Now imagine that it's 1800 and you're Beethoven and you want to write a symphony. You find it harder to write a symphony you don't get sued for than to write a symphony that sounds good. Being Beethoven, you would have complained. You would have said that this system was stupid and the patent holders, who were older composers, uh, would have said, you're just jealous because we had these ideas before you. Why don't you go think of some ideas of your own if you can? In fact, Beethoven had lots of new ideas. And not only that, he knew the effective way to use them, which is why he's considered a great composer. He was able to introduce lots of new ideas into music because he combined in each piece a few new ideas with a lot of familiar ideas. So he made something that stretched people's limits a certain amount. They were co controversial, some even considered shocking. Now, we don't see what's shocking because we got used to them. Society got used to them after Beethoven introduced them. But when they were new, they were shocking enough. But if he had made a composition of nothing but new ideas, people would have rejected it. Uh, the way they reject, you know, because basically, <clears throat> well, I think you're getting the picture. To make the new ideas work, you have to put them together with the well-known ideas. But that's precisely what the patent system won't let you do, because you'll get sued for using the well-known ideas. <coughs> and it's the same in software. If you have a new idea and you want to make it work, you've got to put it into a, a into a situation where most of the ideas are familiar, but some are new. So people that way can get used to new ideas. Even a genius like Beethoven can't reinvent music from zero and make something people will listen to. In the 20th century, some people tried that, and not many people listened to them. And even a genius can't reinvent computing from zero and make something that people will use. You've got to mix your, you combine your new ideas with the old ideas, and that's precisely what the patent system makes dangerous. You'll find that lots of politicians have been misled by the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote. They think that patents are vaguely like copyrights, which is totally false. And then they think, well, copyrights are good for software developers, so patents must be good for software developers too, right? That shows the level of unsophistication of the thinking that, quote, intellectual property, unquote, encourages. So we need to teach politicians to understand what computational idea patents really do to software which means they need to understand this is nothing like copyright. These are monopolies on the ideas that you have to combine by the thousands to make a large program. And if we want people to be able to safely develop large programs, we've got to get the landmines out of the field of software. So, that's my talk. Uh, there are some articles about computational idea patents in gnu.org slash philosophy. Uh, one is called Software Literary Patents.html. It makes a similar analogy, not with music, but with fiction writing, about how patenting ideas that could be literary ideas that could be used in a novel would make it dangerous to write a novel. And uh, another, there, there's another one about the unitary patent and another one about the recommended correction, 
how to how to how to uh, get software give software protection from patents. The proponents of patents love to describe patents as protection, but really what it means is uh, like having a landmine under the idea. So the protection that we need in the software field is protection from patents. But uh, now it's time for the auction. And actually I have a choice for you. Because I can auction this GNU or this adorable GNU that needs a home. Or I can auction this book. Or I guess I could do both. Yeah, I, how many people would like me to auction the GNU? Raise your hand. How many would like me to auction the book? Not very many. Well then, I'll, I'll do the GNU. This is an adorable GNU that needs a home. So I'm going to auction it for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy it, I can sign the card for you. If you have a penguin at home, you need to get a GNU for your penguin. <laughs> because, as we all know, a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. <laughs> Uh, when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount. And don't wait for me to look at you before you shout. Shout immediately, that will help me see you. Uh, it's because I have hearing trouble. You have to shout for me. Uh, we can accept payment in cash or with a bank card if it can make international purchases by phone or with Bitcoin if you have something to make a payment with here. I'll be answering questions for quite a while, so you'll have time to go to a machine and come back with money. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the usual price of 20 euros. Do I get 20 euros for this adorable GNU? How much? 20. I've got 20, do I get 25? How much? I've got 25, do I get 30? How much? I've got 30. Do I get 35? How much? I've got 35. How much? 40. Do I get 45? I've got 40. Do I get 45? I've got 45. Do I get 50? How much? I've got 50. Do I get 55? I got 55. Do I get 60? I've got 55. Do I get 60? 60 euros for this adorable <laughs> I've got 60, do I get 65? I've got 60 euros, do I get 65? 65 for this adorable <laughs> canoe. 65 euros to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. 65. I've got 65, do I get 70? I've got 65, do I get 70? 70 euro. I've got 70. Do I get 75? I've got 70. Do I get 75? 70 euros for this adorable canoe. 75 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Do I get 75 euros? Last chance to bid 75 or more. Last chance to bid 75 or more. Going. Going, how much? I've got 75, do I get 80? I've got 80, do I get 85? 85 euros to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom for this adorable canoe. Do I get 85? Last chance to bid 85 or more. Last chance, going, going. So for 80, please come up and play.
Thank you. So I'll sign it after the questions. Now it's time for questions. I still have hearing problems, the same hearing problems I had ten, five minutes ago. It never gets better. So when you speak to me, you need to speak loud and clearly and slowly. Wait a second. Don't bring the don't bring the mic across around the room. What you should do is you should stay here, and people should line up to ask questions. It works much better that way. It's also fairer because when you when you get a position in line, you will get your turn. It's totally fair that way. So please come down here and get into the queue to ask questions. And you don't have to wait for the queue to be empty. If you have questions, come now. You'll have your turn. You can even sit down while you're waiting because there's some empty seats there. Hello. Uh, I, let's ask, uh, in case I do have a possible idea, and I implement it in uh, my software, uh, what steps should I take to make sure that uh, I that I can validate future patents. Okay, the market. best thing you can do is to publish the idea and then keep a copy of your publication to prove it occurred. If you publish the source code of your program, for instance, if you make it free software, then that's enough. And uh, publishing it on the internet uh, yes, it should, you'll have, really you should ask a patent lawyer for detailed uh, advice like this, but I think yes, that uh, the, if the program, if you can prove that the code was published on the internet, that should be enough. <laughs> but note that someone might get another patent on that idea anyway, because uh, the basically Patent offices are making lots of mistakes all the time. They're under pressure to do a, a hasty job, not a careful job. So, and with so many patents, they can't tell that there are patents on the same idea already. Because these ideas are just math. And math can be formulated in different ways such that they, at first sight, they look quite different. And you have to really study the two together to realize that they're about the same computation. And in the patent office, they don't have time for that. If it's not obviously the same, they say, well, this one is irrelevant, this is something different. Hello. Um, I have a question also. Uh, do you believe that in about 40 or, 40 or 50 years from now, that all the current patents will have expired? And oh, well, I mean, we know that. They expire in most countries, the U.S. being the main exception, a patent expires 20 years after the application is filed, although there are some exceptions in some countries that some patents may last longer. And also it will become more and more difficult for uh, developers to patent their ideas? Well, patent their ideas, it, it's the wrong way of talking about it. It's basically lock off ideas from other developers. Uh, and, but the thing is, if they have ideas, I, and the countries are still foolish enough to allow patents in this field, I suppose they will still get patents. Uh, I'm unable to predict the future, and I think it's a foolish thing. I don't know if there was really a patent office official in 1900 who said there was no room for any more progress. Uh, it might just be a myth. In any case, I know that I can't tell how much more progress can be made. I don't know what's going to happen in 40 or 50 years, but I do know this, that when the context changes, the old ideas become the wrong way to do things. And there are fairly obvious new ways to do things in the new context that nobody would have thought about before. Maybe somebody would have thought about them for two seconds 
but why bother? They don't fit the they didn't fit the context then, so they would have been useless. And then when the context changes, different ideas become useful, and each one has to be first seen by somebody. And if that somebody gets a patent on it, they make this whole new field a minefield for developers. And this kind of churn seems to happen from time to time, and it's just harmful. Thank you very much. About, uh, Please speak louder, I can't hear you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you spoke about uh, confronting the patent system by working within the system. No, I didn't. I, I, spoke with, I spoke about what a developer might do to try to work with the system. Yeah, we Carry to follow the rules of the system carefully. Exactly. The, the, that was Which exactly is different from trying to change the system from within. It, this doesn't change the system at all. So, uh, uh, yeah, this is exactly what I mean. Uh, the, uh, I thought about an alternative uh, way to confront the system by totally disregarding that. Uh, but, uh, and uh, I believe this could be possible by the free software ecosystem, meaning that uh, let's say, for example, uh, I do write uh, a program that uh, implements the LCW algorithm. Well, but the thing uh, is, you, I don't think you quite get the point. But uh, you can ignore the patent system, but it won't ignore you. Yes, I published uh, this program, but it's not a business. It's uh, first well, software. Okay. Well, first of all, first of all, okay. Listen. First of all. It is a mistake to think that free software means it's not a business. There are free software businesses and it's very important what they do. However, it's true that you can have a non-commercial project. That doesn't mean you're safe. Yeah, it doesn't, but uh, shouldn't uh, some programmer or lawyer know programming uh, search for my program actively to find out? Well, some do, yeah. I mean, basically, you don't know that. You're making an assumption, and it's not always true. It's partly true. It's true that many patent holders are not interested in suing you unless you've got substantial money. But some want to shut down projects that they don't like. And so you're not safe. Yeah, me as an individual, yes, but... Uh... In the uh, best case scenario, my code will have been uh, cloned or copied. Well, maybe. You, it, you could, it's often, it, often you don't get attacked. So indeed, this is what we all do. But that doesn't mean the system isn't dangerous and harmful. The patent system. It, it is dangerous and harmful. It doesn't get everybody every day. Yeah, um, so... Okay, so your view is that uh, this doesn't work, we have to confront it? Uh, no, I'm not saying that. I don't know what you mean even by confront. That's too vague. I have no idea what you're talking about. I say what we need to do is organize and change the law so that software development is safe from patents. Safe from patents. When you say confront, I don't know what you mean. I have no idea what you're talking about there. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, let's see that I mean exactly what uh, you said. Exactly. Well, I said many things. Are you talking about what I said at the be Are you talking about what I said in the early part of my speech? What it would be like to work with the patent system? Nobody recommends that. Nobody does that, and lawyers don't recommend that. What lawyers recommend is ignore, keep your eyes shut, and hope. Thanks. At least in the U.S. they do. Hi, uh, my question is, do you think that uh, software patents are wrong uh, as uh, a fundamental idea? Should we ditch software patents uh, altogether or make a better patent uh, system? First of all, um, 
I don't want to call them software patents. I should change the title. Uh, they're computational idea patents. Absolutely. And if there were just a handful of them, they wouldn't, and they were fairly narrow, they might not be an, impo an important problem. But that's not going to happen. You see, the dynamic that operates on every patent office is to try to make as many patents as possible. And to make the patents broad so that applicants want to get them. And so that patents will have a big, important effect on society. <coughs> So, it's unstable. The idea of a patent system where there were not very many patents and they didn't affect very many things, that's not politically stable. It's much clearer and safer to say software is excluded from patent because then, then no, there's no way to push that. There's no way to push the boundaries so that the patents get to be more and more and bigger and bigger. There is no good served by having patents in the software field. It's not needed for anything. Thank you very much. We had plenty of research and plenty of progress in the software field before patents were allowed. Hello. Uh, you've argued against patents in medicine. I can't hear you very well. Oh, now? Okay. You've also argued against patents in uh, medicine and uh, agriculture. Do you think there is any place for patents, or should they be done away? Okay. I see no reason to have a patent system. But in many fields of industry, it may not matter very much. That is. Uh, in fields where there are big companies dealing with each other and stable, maybe the patents don't matter, don't change things very much. But there is no field where th there's a reason to believe they do good. Okay, thanks very much. Are there any more questions or are we done? Take get the microphone, come get in the queue. Uh, Richard, my friend uh, Yanni is an artist, and he did this drawing of you. Oh. And he was hoping that you might be able to sell it to the people here, and the contributions go to the FSF. Really? I guess I could. I can auction this drawing, which is pretty good. Here you can see it. Uh, if anyone wants to come take a closer look before the auction, here's your chance. <laughs> come up, come up and take a look if you're thinking of bidding. Um, well, uh, the rules are the same and I'll start yeah, I'm sure someone will bid 20. Start at five. Say, start local. 20? I've got 20 euros. Do I get 25? I've got 20 euros. Do I get 25 for this adorable? <laughs> Do I get 25 for this adorable drawing that needs a home? <laughs> 25 euros to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Do I get 25? 25 euros or more. Last chance to bid 25 or more. When else will you be able to get a, a very well done drawing of me? <laughs> 25 or more. How much? I've got 25, do I get 30? I've got 25, do I get 30? I've got 30, do I get 35? 
I've got 30. Do I get 35? 35 euros or more for this adorable <laughs> drawing. $35 or more to defend freedom. Last chance to bid 35 or more. Last chance. Going. Going. Gone for 30. Please come up and go. Yes. Um, I don't know if there's much enough interest in the book. You think I should? How many people are interested in bidding for the book? Uh, only one, it seems. Yeah, you should take it right now. I'll, I'll sign it after uh, if it's appropriate. I don't know whether I should sign a drawing made by someone else. <laughs> um, uh, so, how many people here are interested in bidding for the book? So far I only saw one. Well, but you're together. Uh, <laughs> nah, it's not enough interest. I'll save it for another time. Uh, so, uh, now, are there any more questions? Any more questions? Or are we done? So, over there we're still selling Free Software Foundation merchandise. You can support us. There are these little GNU head buttons and there are big Ask Me About Free Software buttons. And there are metal stickers that say GNU slash Linux inside. The idea is you put them on your computer. There are also, I hope, yeah, there's still some stickers there and we can put out some more, I guess. I've got some more here.